Hi, my name is Dawn Sheen, and I am a school psychologist in Davis School District. Um, I currently am on the Related Services Administration team, as well as I'm over the students, um, the Special Education ELL Committee, which is a committee that reviews files to um, and consults with teams when they're referring English language learners for special education. So today we're going to talk about creative strategies to support social emotional learning. So as we know, it's important to state your objectives. And um, so my objectives are first to identify that you'll be able to identify components of an effective SEL approach. Second, identify multiple commercial curriculums. I want you to name three types of materials that are helpful to have on hand when creative activities. And you can name more than that if you need to. Not if you need to. You will be able to name more than that. But I want you to do at least three. Um, name two ways that you can therapeutically modify a commercial board game. And then also, um, we're going to go over some of my ideas for teaching size of a problem. And I want you to be able to kind of identify some of those ideas when we're done. So to start, social emotional learning, there is a um, organization called CASEL. Um, they are an organization that looks at um, social emotional learning. And they have done research and they have ideas for important approaches for social emotional learning. So the first one that they taught, there are four different approaches that you can use when you're teaching um, social emotional skills. So when we look at social emotional learning approaches, um, there's an organization called CASEL. Um, and they, it's the Collaboration for Academic and Social Emotional Learning. And they have come up with several different um, approaches for social emotional learning that people use and that are um, helpful to use for social emotional learning. The first is explicit social emotional learning skills instruction. So that's teaching kids directly social emotional learning skills. The second is teacher instructional practices. So every teacher has good instructional practices and throughout their lessons, social emotional learning should be embedded within them. So one example of how teachers practice, um, the teacher, a teacher practice that is helpful for social emotional learning is cooperative learning. Because inherent in cooperative learning is interaction with your peers. And that's part of social emotional learning. The third thing is integration of social emotional learning with academic curricular areas. So for example, um, in PE, that's not academic, but it's one of the required areas. In PE, kids will learn how to be on a team, and they have to learn specific skills to be on a team. Um, another um, example might be in an English class, where kids are um, working together to teach pair share. That's cooperative learning, but they may also be reading a story, and within that story are embedded specific skills or specific struggles that kids might be having, and the teacher can use those um, that curriculum to teach kids how to deal with struggles and how to problem solve through the stories. And then the fourth way is through organizational, culture, and climate strategies. And those are our standard positive behavior supports. So a lot of schools might have a Principals 200 Club, um, and that's where the kid would get, the, the kid, the child or student would get some sort of reinforcement when they are um, following expectations or performing some type of skill, the school would determine what they're focusing on. And then they get to put their name up on a board. And then um, at the end of a certain period of time, people who are on a specific line, like when there's five in a row, they all get a reward. Um, that's just one example of PBIS. But there's lots of different ways PBIS is um, incorporated. We are going to focus on explicit social emotional learning skills instruction. Um, now this is something that I love doing. I love teaching kids social emotional skills. Um, obviously that's why I'm a school psychologist, but I, I really love um, making it fun. So according to Castle, there are some effective SEL approaches. And in order to be effective, they should follow SAFE, which is it's the acronym. So first, they need to be sequenced. The activities, they're connected and coordinated. It needs to make sense, the direction you're going with them. Um, second is they need to be active. The kids need to be 
um, like active learning strategies need to be used so that they can engage the students because students who are bored are not going to pay attention. The um, components within your curriculum need to be focused and they need to be focusing on developing personal or social skills, which makes perfect sense to me if you're teaching social skills. You want your curriculum to focus on that. And then the last thing is it needs to be explicit. Um, and the, so your instruction needs to target the specific social emotional skills. But here's a question. How do you find research-based curriculum? I will tell you. <laughs> um, Castle has some guides that they have created. And if you go to this link, castle.org slash guide, there are, um, they have a list of materials that they have reviewed and they have indicated like how effective they are, how helpful they are. And they have that list for both elementary and then they also have one for secondary. So as you go through, um, so it's important though to recognize that the programs that were evaluated are actually classroom-based programs. But when you are teaching social emotional skills, I personally have found that a lot of classroom-based programs are very easily modified for small groups um, within my setting. And the skills that are in the classroom-based programs are also very helpful. So these, this is curriculum that I have used that I like. Um, so curriculum that Castle has evaluated that I've used, I Can Problem Solve is one of them. And then another one called Second Step. I really, really like Second Step, particularly for the younger kids. Um, uh, preschool and kindergarten, first grade age. I think it's really engaging for them. So some curriculums that were not evaluated by Castle, but they are evidence-based. And I actually, in more recent years, have used all of these and quite consistently. Skill Streaming, Thinking, Feeling, Behaving, it's a book. Um, Think Social is an excellent curriculum. Zones of Regulation is also really, really good. Superheroes Social Skills um, that was created at the universe in conjunction with the University of Utah. And then Superflex in the Unthinkables is also a great program. Superflex in the Unthinkables kind of um, incorporates the think social terminology, so it's, it's quite good. Um, so these are really good examples of curriculum. But something that I have found when I'm teaching is sometimes I will use all of the curriculum materials and I get to the end and the students still have not got it. Um, and I really want to instruct them more or give them more practice. And so in order to do that, it's time to get creative. So the really important thing though is first, don't reinvent the wheel. There are a lot of research resources out there that can help you um, to create curriculum materials that will go with the research-based curriculum. So Teachers Pay Teachers, I have found is a wonderful resource. Um, Pinterest is great. And then the other thing is I will frequently do Google searches now, the really important thing with Google, if you're doing a Google image search in particular, is if you don't want to get the same thing that you get on Pinterest, you need to type in minus Pinterest because then you'll, you won't get any of the Pinterest recommended. Not Pinterest recommended, it won't take you directly to Pinterest um, when you're doing your search. So those are my tips for that. So. I thought it was important to include some of the Teachers Pay Teachers sellers that I've used that I have found valuable materials. So, and this is just a list. I will let you look for un momento. Um, the, all of them have had materials that I have used consistently. Um, so Pathways to Success is great. One Stop Counseling Shop. Counselor Chelsea, Mental Fills Counseling Tools, The Helpful Counselor, and Social Talk. Most of these also have Pinterest pages, and they also have blogs. So that is helpful. And then Pinterest follower, Pinners that I follow is, of course, I follow NASP. They have good ideas. Um, the Adventurous School Counselor is a great one. The Helpful Counselor, she was on the Teachers Pay Teachers as well. 
Pedia staff is really good. They're a contract company and they have um, a lot of Pinterest boards related to lots of different related server um, things. And so, for example, they would they have things related to occupational therapy, sensory concerns, um, but lots of school psychology thing, lots of different um, activities that you can use. Another one that I highly recommend is Pam Dyson Play Therapy. Um, she is a play therapist and she runs a company at, that is, um, she's a licensed play therapist and the company is certified to train play therapists. And um, she has great Pinterest activities, but she also has a YouTube channel. And on her YouTube channel, you can um, watch her. She trains different play therapy ideas. And some of those are, here's how you play to interact with emotions. Here's how I, um, like she might take Jenga and talk about how she uses Jenga to do X, Y, Z. Um, so I very much recommend her because you can get a lot of good ideas from her. And then Gil Kuzma, Gil, Jill Kuzma is a speech therapist, but she has a lot of social emotional resources. I actually um, get most of her stuff on her blog. Um, she has, in fact, some of the resources I'm gonna show you later come from her. So when you're creating your social emotional activities, um, you need to think about why you need to do the activity. So what's your objective? Does your student need more explicit instruction or do they just need more practice on the skill? Um, what have you already done to teach and practice? If you've already tried it, don't redo it because you need to try something different. What knowledge do they already have? Um, so for example, we're gonna talk about UNO later. There are some skills that kids need to have when they're playing UNO and you wouldn't wanna throw that at them without teaching them some of those skills. Um, are you working with a group or one-on-one? -on -one? That's gonna change the type of activity you use. Do they have a specific interest that can be used during the activity to build connections? And then what materials do you already have available that can be used or modified for an activity? So board games, balls, balloons, um, dice, feelings cards, situation like picture cards, or even situations written out, role plays, those kinds of things. So I have a list of materials that I think are really helpful when you are creating activities. So the first one, I think it's really helpful to have balls. Um, and you can use balls in a lot of different ways. I have, for example, when I was, we'll get into this, but one of the lessons that I teach is size of a problem. And um, the size of the problem that we teach are big, medium, and small. And one of the things that I have done in the past is luckily I had um, three garbage cans in one of my rooms. And so I took each garbage can and I lined them up and I wrote small, medium, and big. And then the kids stood on the, um, I had a line how far they had to stand. And we modified that for those that struggled. Um, and I gave them a situation and they threw the ball into what size they thought the problem was. And so it was a simple way to do an activity that was already um, recommended, but it made it a little bit more engaging so they were more interested in it. Um, another thing you can do with balls is you can write questions or numbers on the ball, or you can get a ball that just has a lot of different colors on it, throw it to the student, and then um, wherever their thumb lands, you ask a question or have them do a role play or whatever based on the number or color. Um, another thing that's really helpful to have is dice. I learned this in early on. Um, I would create my own board games and then I would get ready to do it and realize I had no dice. <laughs> and so um, I had to get creative. So maybe we used a coin and heads was one space and tails was three. Or um, phones have apps that you can roll dice, but the easiest is if you just have dice on hand. And then role playing and situation cards. Um, this takes time to create unless you purchase them, but I have found the most benefit from creating them based on the student's own um, situations. So one of the things that I've done in the past to help kids to create my own situation cards is we played Candyland. This was with a younger group 
and each color was assigned a feeling. And then as they went to that color, they had to either um, name why they would feel that way or why someone else might feel that way. And then in that, through that process, I wrote down all of the situations that they were telling me. And then I created role play and situation cards for um, future lessons. And that was really, it, it was cool because it personalized it to the kids. And then another thing is talking to the teachers and parents about specific problem situations. So it's really interesting when you do that because you can write down a problem that they very specifically had and you can see, do they really not understand or did they get it and know what they should do but just in the moment were able to do it? So that one's really interesting. A lot of times kids will be like, oh, that's totally a small problem, but in the moment they were like exploding. So. It's kind of a good um, assessment, mini assessment tool, but also really good to keep them engaged. So feelings and situation picture cards. Um, this is something that I have found particularly helpful for kids, especially that struggle with reading, or um, kids with autism who struggle to pick out the details, because then you can use the situation picture cards to um, point out the details that they need to be paying attention to. So um, there are lots of websites that you can find them on. You can also do a Google image search for feelings and situations. And if you have access to the handout for, um, for the US presentation, this PowerPoint and is on it. And then I also have included, and I'll show you later, um, all of the picture situation cards that I have gotten off of Google. Um, conversation starter questions are awesome. There's a ton of them. A lot of families will, like fam like mom bloggers, will have conversation starter questions for dinner time conversation or whatever. And those are really good. And then would you rather questions. The kids love would you rather questions. And the sillier, the better. Sometimes kids with autism struggle a little more with the silly ones. But for the most part, when I'm playing a game and we have... Usually I'll have um, the would you rather questions embedded within the game in addition to whatever skill card we're working on. And so they might be able to answer a would you rather question and they always hope for the would you rather question because that's more fun than the role plays. <laughs> um, my students actually two years ago wanted to create their own and they came up with some really funny ones. So. That year, we actually ended each session with a would you rather question that the students had created. They just made one up on the spot. So that was kind of fun. Okay, so some board games that I think are helpful. Um, so Uno is one that you can modify in so many ways. Sorry, so um, when my nieces and nephew were younger, I used to tell them that my job was to make kids cry. And um, they were like, yeah, Dawn. But really, I feel like it's really important to provide situations for the kids where they have to use the skills that you're teaching them. And so I play sorry, because that is like guaranteed going to make a kid cry. Um, in fact, I had one student, and it would have worked great if I was the only one, but the other student in the group targeted this kid as well on meltdown 45 minutes and I realized he has a few more skills to learn <laughs> um, but sorry is great there's another game called Jishaku which is awesome um, and I know that I'm saying it wrong I can't remember how to say it um, but Jishaku as I say it means magnet in Japanese and I will show you a way that I use this in a little while um, Candyland is another really good one for the littles. Shoots and ladders, Chinese checkers, Jenga. Uh, and then I also use Eye Spy Eagle Eye. Um, one of the things that I do with this is we, when we're playing it, I have the kids look for it. And when they're starting to get frustrated, um, I make sure that I know where whatever the item is, is already. And I will break it down so that they can kind of see where they need to look, um, a smaller area. 
And then we talk about how when you're problem solving, breaking things down is helpful. If you're trying to look at everything, it can get overwhelming. But if you can break it down and just focus on the small, then it makes it easier. Um, I've done that with really complicated mazes as well. I'll print out a super hard maze. The kids will get really frustrated. And then I will have modified the maze by putting dots in different areas so it kind of guides them. So they just have to get to the next dot. And that is helpful as well to teach that skill, that sometimes you just have to break it down. Do what comes next. Don't try and look at the whole thing. No, the dots aren't on the original. And, and now as I'm talking out loud, I think it's probably even better to write numbers so they know step one, step two. So they just have to get to the next step. Okay, so for when you're therapeutically modifying a commercial game, um, you are going to do a couple of things. So the first thing you need to do is think about what skills a child needs to play the specific game. So let's think about UNO. What kinds of skills does a child need to be able to play UNO? Yeah, Self-calming skills. Also planning. Um, if they want to win, they need to be able to plan. And then being able to read other people's body language. Now we're not teaching them to play poker, but Sometimes you can teach them, you know, like when kids are, when their facial expressions are like, oh, when you put something down. Um, so they need all of these skills. So therapeutically modifying a commercial game sometimes is just as simple as talking through the skill as they're doing it. So for example, when I'm playing Uno, as we are um, going through each turn, I will talk to the kids and I will say, whose turn is it? How can you tell? Are you watching? And so I'm really just pointing out those skills throughout the game. So it's not like a specific, I don't have any other objective except to make sure that they're doing the skills. Um, one of the biggest ones that I use with UNO, if I don't have, um, if the objective is just to play UNO, is really that executive skill of, of paying attention to what's happening. Um, that's a big one. Because if you're not paying attention, you don't know whose turn it is. So um, I had one group that I, I spent probably three sessions just doing, well, we didn't just do UNO. We did other games as well that required this. But for three sessions, it was, we just focused on looking at the people who were playing the game. Um, and it, but after the third session, it was like they, they started getting it. I could ask whose turn is it, and they all knew. Yay, it was awesome. Um, so the second thing is, if the skill you want to practice isn't inherent in the game, or I just said that. If it's inherent, that's what I just said. Play it using lots of feedback. Now, if needed, you can invent rules for the game. So for example, for UNO, this is how I'll use it most often. If you use, so like, the special rules. If you have a matching number rather than a color, then you have to answer can't see my screen. The font's too small. So you have to answer a question from the question cards that you conveniently, as a practitioner, have on hand. If you put down a special card, like, um, like the reverse or the skip, then you would answer a feelings question specific to the color that they have put down. And then the wild cards got the would you rather question. Um, and I did that on purpose because there are fewer wild cards, and I didn't want them just to be answering a would you rather question. However, if we are answering would you rather questions, um, oftentimes we will have practiced and learned the skill of having a conversation and the important parts of how to ask a question or answer a question. And so during would you rather questions, um, so for example, I'm going to practice with you, Heather. Okay. So, Heather, would you rather have a ketchup dispensing navel or a pencil sharpener in your nose? Ketchup dispensing navel. Okay, now let's think about this. Did you look at me? Did you face me? Did you look me in the eye? Did you use a good voice? Your tone of voice? Yeah, your tone of voice was good. Good. Is your body relaxed? You used fever, way to go. Right. Yeah, and so that's the skill that I had 
taught previously is fever, how to, um, the appropriate social skill for talking. So, and I might do that with the questions as well, but it depends on the skill that we're practicing. For Jenga, you might, you can write numbers on the blocks or um, Walmart sells a Jenga that has different colors and you can um, answer questions or complete tasks based on whatever number they pull. Um, at US, one of the uh, participants indicated that he uses Jenga by having, he does it in teams. And so they have to tell each other where to put it. So one of them's in charge of talking and the other one's in charge of moving. And they do it as a team and he teaches sort of collaboration and teamwork in that way, which I think is really cool. Okay, so another game that is really good to use to therapeutically modify is Connect Four. Um, so one of the ways that you can do that is by writing numbers on each of the little chips, or you can um, put a colored sticker on each of the chips. And then each time they use one of the chips, they have to answer a question um, or do a role play or something like that corresponding to the number or color when they use the chip. Now, I think another way that you could therapeutically modify this is to practice accepting no for an answer. By making the child, I mean by asking the child to um, ask you where they can put their chip if it's, um, and then you would say yes or no and then they have to Accept no for an answer. And in doing that, you could teach accepting no for an answer and self-regulation skills. Now, if you want to make it really fair, you could have them, you could ask them as well so they can tell you where you can put your chips. But um, either way. So another game, like I said, that I love is Jishaku. And um, I am going to get it out so you can see. Jishaku, um, I think I said this already, means magnet in Japanese. And it is really a fun game. Um, kids, it's a favorite for kids. The way it works is you have these magnets. And then you have, um, it's kind of like a mattress pad. The object of the game is to get rid of all the magnets in your hand. What you do in order to do that is you place them, and you want to place them in such a way that they won't connect with another magnet. So if I place this right there, it doesn't connect. But then if I put it down and it connects, surprisingly, I have to pick up all of the ones that it connected with. So this is a good one to teach um, self-regulation but you can use it in a lot of different ways as well. So one of the ways I teach it is, or I use it to practice asking for something, okay? So Heather's going to be my, my model student here. So the skills for asking for something are, um, look at the person, say their name, get their attention appropriately. Um, so it's either saying their name or touching them on the shoulder. Um, Make your request, wait for an answer, and accept the answer, okay? So I'm going to put mine down, and Heather, the rule for this game is she has to ask me where she can put it, if she can put it here. So I'm going to do a model. Um, so I'm going to say, so I'm going to look at her, get her attention, Heather, can I put my magnet right here? Okay, and now it's her turn. Did you look at me? You I forgot. Totally did it first. Yeah, did you say my name? Yeah. Did you ask in a kind voice with a good time? Yeah. Yeah, and did you wait for an answer? No, because I started talking. Okay, but let's try that again with okay. eye contact. Okay. So, Don, can I put my magnet? Yeah, magnet's fine. Right there. Yes, you can. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Sorry. Normally I would say, did you look at me? Yes. Did you ask in a nice voice? Yes. Did you wait for an answer? Yes. Good job. Go ahead and put it right there. And then you would just go on kind of in that way. Sometimes it gets tedious for kids that you do that on every single turn. But um, do it enough that they get practice. So, And then the kids love to connect them. Um, I have used this in a lot of other ways as well. I have played it with kids um, doing uh, impulse, um, impulsivity. So we play it being impulsive, and then we play it thinking and planning, and we see what the difference is. Um, 
and kids like it that way because you're like throwing it as fast as you can, both of you. And it, it's just engaging for the kids. Um, I have, uh, I write numbers and le- I have written numbers and letters on the stones because they're stones um, and they're black. Permanent marker doesn't work. You need to get an oil-based Sharpie um, and you can write them with that. And then um, practice making a request and then, oh, having an additional consequence. So if they end up picking up a stone, maybe you could have a question or a role play that they have to do. Um, I use this also as a reinforcer because you can play it very quickly. And um, so the last three minutes, if the kids have earned a reinforcer, a lot of times they'll choose to play this. So that's a really good one. Now we're to my favorite part. Um, so one of my favorite skills that I teach kids is called size of a problem. And when you're looking at size of a problem, there are small problems, medium problems, and big problems. And the, so the actual curriculum, this is from the Think Social curriculum. She actually calls small problems tiny glitches, but I think that's confusing for kids. So I just say big, medium, and small. Bill Kuzma, who is the speech therapist that I referred to earlier, he um, has materials that he created that really break it down really well. So she asks very specific questions that make it super concrete for the kids. So a big problem, um, she talks about how many people it affects, 10 or more people, how long does it last, months or years, um, what kind of harm is involved, there's physical danger, injury, or death. So a lot of times you'll get kids who are like, we'll talk, they, the teacher kept them in from recess, and they had a total meltdown, and you're like, how big is this problem? This problem is so big! And do you say, oh, did somebody die? No. Did somebody get really hurt and have to go to the hospital? No. Is it big? <laughs> no, it's not. It gives them a concrete way to kind of figure it out. So she has um, written the concrete answers for each step, each size of a problem. Um, and then the way I use it, I wanted to make it a little bit more engaging for kids, and I wanted them to be more interactive with the materials. So I created an activity. I took her information. And I created an activity, and this actually stays up on my board all year long. And what I do is I put up these questions, and then I give the kids these. And I have color-coded them because some of the answers are kind of similar. So I color-coded them so I knew which, um, which section it went under. And then, so usually I will have taught the skill first, and then this is kind of after I've taught it, they're... Um, moving things around. And so we start with the pink, and we know that's how many people does it affect. And then each of them have one of the colors, and they have to determine which size of the problem it is. And, um, And I will actually do this activity more than once because I want them to really cement it in their brain. But it's it's an engaging way because they're looking at it, they're putting it up. You can teach math skills because you can be like, is three to nine larger, greater than, or less than 10 or more? And so you're teaching that vocabulary as well. Um, Is 15 minutes greater than or less than one hour? Um, So, and the kids are engaged. And I keep this up all year because invariably with the, during the group, the kids are going to have meltdowns and struggles because I try to sugar it. <laughs> um, and so we'll talk through the different sizes of problems. And it's not a perfect system. I mean, sometimes you'll have a problem that they have very upset feelings, but it's actually a small problem. So sometimes they'll be like, but my feelings are so upset. Um, but you can kind of talk them through that. And then for the littles, this, this was too complicated. It was too much for them to understand. And so I created 
a problem continuum for younger children. Um, and it looks like this. So one of the preschool teachers in my building uses mouse problem and elephant problem. And I wanted to include the medium sized problem. And so I called it a monkey problem. And I just broke it down into much fewer things. And my, my littles and those who have lower language um, are, are able to understand it better. With so, and you can actually, so this one I didn't put up on the board, but I did cut out each of the boxes and we arranged it on the table. So they were able to do that. So that's one thing that I do um, for teaching problem continuum for younger children. And then as you're teaching, another thing that's really good that can help you creatively is to have videos. So I'm going to show you two videos that are my favorites for size of a problem. So this is the first one. And as I go through the videos, I will talk to the kids and um, ask them, what do you think is going to happen? So what do you think is going to happen? Well, it looks like he really likes that ice cream. You can tell. Look at his smile. Uh-oh. What's he going to do? Feeling. Oh, dear. How big is this problem? How big is his reaction? Oh my goodness. The kids love this video. They think it's hysterical. <laughs> and then we have a discussion about what could he have done and was it really that big of a problem and and then you talk about you go back to the problem continuum and show them and discuss each of those sections um, and then this commercial is my positive example How do you think he feels? <laughs> um, and then we talk about how big is the problem and did he solve it? And what's his reaction? Did it match the size of the problem? So um, sometimes the size of the problem and the size of the reaction doesn't match. And so we talk about ways to get the size of your reaction down to match the size of the problem. So one of the ways that I do this, I love this particular um, resource. So it's called the stress scale, and I have a link to it in the handout so that you can find it. I um, mean, it gives very explicit instructions on how to, how to use it. I'm going to scroll really fast. Um, but this is my favorite part. And what I will do is, so you actually, as you later in the handout, it breaks it down even more. So you, you start by talking about what does your face look like at each of these levels of stress? And um, how are you feeling? I'm like, okay, I can see it, but sometimes you need to look at it longer. And then at each of those levels of stress, you list what can you do. Um, and then when you've done those two, you come back to the top and you fill out a 
whole thing. So, and it has all of the colors, what it looks like, what it feels like, and what you can do. Now, what I have done with this is I've had the kids fill it out, and then I will actually shrink it down into a smaller visual for them to put on their desk, which means you have to keep it simple because the words have to be big enough for them to see. But the other thing that I really like about this particular resource is it also has a caregiver guide. So what can the teacher do or the parent do when the, their child is at each of those levels? Um, I use this when I... When I, I use this when I'm doing, um, like if I have a student I'm doing a risk assessment on and I don't feel like the risk is super high, but I do see that they're kind of escalated and having a hard time with their emotions, this will be their kind of, their plan for what do you do at each level before it gets to the point that you're wanting to hurt yourself in some way. Um, and then, so, but also, I, another activity that I've done is I have a bulletin board that is actually on, it's really cool in my office. Um, I'm not at Clinton anymore, but when I was at my office at the school that I was at last year, they had a bulletin board, a huge bulletin board right outside my door. And it was on the, my office is right next to the exit to the school. So the kids looked at it every time they went out to recess. And, um, I got these coping skills cards and the, um, the feelings cards from Teachers Pay Teachers, and I have a link to those as well in my handout. Uh, I think I paid 2 or $3 for each one. And then um, I created the border with the feelings. Now, one of the reasons I really like these feelings cards is because a lot of times when you're looking at feelings and pictures of feelings, what do you see? Just the face. But we don't just express feelings with our face. We use our whole body. And I felt like that was really important. So I really like these feelings cards because it shows what you're not just your face. So because that's an important cues is what's happening in your body. Um, and then the calm down cards, it has a whole bunch of different coping skills. And what I will do with these, besides put them on a bulletin board, is um, I will pull out the coping cards and I will have the students sort them into things I've tried and didn't work, things I have not tried but am willing to try, and things that work. And then things that I haven't tried and I don't care to. So there's four things. And then we can create. We use that with, I use it with the stress thermometer. So we do the coping sort first, and then we do the stress thermometer and add those things where they're going to be most helpful. And then the last thing that I do, well, not the last thing, but the last thing I'm going to talk about is craft projects. So kids who um, struggle with fine motor skills, a guaranteed meltdown happens when you do craft projects. So um, now I'm not looking for a huge meltdown like what happened in the sorry game. I need them to be able to still think through using the skill. So what I will do is I will choose projects that are just a tiny bit above their level so that they have to use the skill of asking for help, of raising their hand, of and of self-regulation. So these are projects that I've done, and you can kind of tell when you look at them that I usually do them at Christmas time um, or at holiday time. It's my fun activity. So... Um, this, the train I actually have used by just handing the kids the materials and a picture and saying, okay, go, to see if they can formulate a plan and, and create it. And some have been able to and some have really struggled. The other thing that's really important when you're creating a craft project is you need to make sure all of the materials are on hand and organized. So like for the train, I had all of the materials readily available. Um, they were in a baggie. There was, so what they needed for the train. And I use glue dots. I did not use hot glue. Um, so glue dots you can find at the craft store. And I had the exact number of glue dots that they needed in their, in their bag. Um, the Sculpey um, with the snowman. This is a sock snowman that's actually really easy to do because it just uses rubber bands and socks. Um, and then they have to have scissor skills and 
be able to glue and stuff. And then the, the calm down bottle, the kids liked this quite a bit. And these are the squeeze balls. Now, I do have to say, online you will see some squeeze balls that are made with Play-Doh. I did a presentation at BYU and I had never done the Play-Doh ones before. I usually use flour. And um, I decided to test it out on the BYU students. It did not go well. I mean, they managed it, they figured it out, but um, I decided I wouldn't use it with my second graders <laughs> because it was too complicated. So there you go. And then if you have any questions, you can feel free to contact me at dsheen at dsdmail.net. The handouts are available at the US conference website. And I'm just gonna show you really quickly what the, Get it? What it looks like. <coughs> so when you pull up the website, you click this, and then the handouts load. And this is the handout, so creative strategies to support social emotional learning. And it'll take just a second to load. Well, you can't see because the computer disconnected again. Literally had two minutes left. Oh, keep going. Great. So, as you can see, this is the handout. And um, it has the entire PowerPoint. It has my, my email address. And then as you go down, I'm going to go fast through the PowerPoint. Hopefully. Loading. It's loading. And you get to, so right after the PowerPoint, I have a list of all of the curriculum and materials that I referenced um, with links. So you can just click on the link. And then I have my problem, the small, the little kid problem continuum, the materials for the larger continuum. I guess I should scroll slowly. As you can see. And then I have spent a lot of time finding pictures. I actually have included my feelings pictures as well as um, quite a few feelings pictures and then the problem situations. So, no, they're pictures. I'll show you um, so that you have them. They're just small. But at least, but they're here, so you have them. So thank you so much for participating and watching, and I hope you have a great day.